Good evening, everybody. Welcome to a tutorial on Shader Graph. Now, why are we doing a tutorial on Shader Graph today? Um, because it changed. Very recently, it changed. And um, I am currently using 2020.2, the Unity version. And you're going to realize that things have changed just a tiny little bit. When we go over to create ourselves a shader, there is a bunch of new options that comes in. First, you can still create shader like before. So using, um, well, uh, I, I believe it's CG code. It's not HLSL, it's CG code. So you can still do that, of course, but then you can have the option to do a blank shader graph or uh, a subgraph. So I'm going to go with the blank shader graph. I want to show you the new interface. We're just going to be messing around with this today, so might as well just call it this. When we open this up now, you're going to realize that they've split this in two, which is very, very cool because if you used to make shader in the past um, when you wrote it manually, um, then you know that you need a vertex shader and also a fragment shader. Vertex stands for everything regarding the geometry. So where are the vertex going to be rendered? And the fragment, of course, is for, or also known as pixel shader, is for how you color those. So you're going to realize that if we put it on empty, we really have nothing here at all, basically. And I'm going to be using this on one object so you can actually see it. So when we create a new shader um, through Shader Graph, it actually get itself, uh, well, it puts himself in your project folder, right? So if I go over and I use this orb, for example, here, the sphere, I can go ahead, I'll give it a new material that I'll also call test. In this test material, I'll put it on top of the orb. And as you can see, it's the right one. You can change the color and everything. But now I'm going to go over to the shader section at the top. And I'm going to be changing that to the test, which now means that the sphere that we see on the screen right now is connected to this very specific test graph. Um, and I'm going to keep it in a window just like this so we can see both things while we actually change them. Now, do know that every time you do a change to a shader in shader graph, you'll need to hit the save asset. What we need to do first is assign who are we rendering for, which um, render pipeline are we rendering for. So if we click here, you're going to see that you have the universal or, or the HDRP if you're using that one as well. And my understanding is that you can create your own pipeline as well that would go under here. So when we do that, we get some field that auto populate itself. And if we just save this, then it's just going to use the default value that it has right here. So as you can see, the change has been done and now we have a default um, unity shader, you could say. Now, as we mentioned earlier, vertex is for everything regarding the geometry. So that's why you have an object space and fragment is for everything regarding how we color this. So um, if the base color change, of course, that's going to be overridden as well. I don't know why I use red. Red is really hard on the eyes. All right, let's do, let's do a light blue. Okay. Um, you get the point, right? And you can also decide whether or not this is uh, transparent or not by changing under the graph settings here, you can change. Uh, if you're rendering for opaque or a surface that is transparent, just like this. And by doing so, you're going to realize that we add a new field to our node. That field is, of course, the alpha. So we could say 0.5. Now our ball is transparent. And you can see the floor beneath it. Now with these two concepts in mind, you are starting to realize that you could do a lot of things with these two, right? So the vertex and also the fragment shader. Uh, for example, we could do a simple movement of... Um, of the vertex without really being moving the thing in the game for real. So the object would stay there at the same place, but the GPU would render it in such a way that it's somewhere else to your eye. So the, the most basic example that come to me is something like uh, using, um, just adding the current value that we have right now for this object. So we can say object, and I've added a new node by just pressing on spacebar, I believe. Yep, so spacebar, object, and here is the position of that object in um, world space, I believe. If I just drag it here, nothing changed. So that's the same value. I just want to be cool. Actually, no, it's not the same value. <laughs> Where is it? Okay, I lost my ball. Okay, so let's try another node. Let's write the position node on itself and let's do the object position. That's kind of what I wanted, I believe. Yep, okay, cool. So let's just assume that this right here is the, um, it's the same exact thing, right? As vertex. So you don't see any changes in between what we had and also what we have right now. Um, so. With that in mind, you could say that every time we render this object, we could render it in a different fashion so it could move just a little, little tiny bit in a certain direction. Now to move this every frame, we could use something like a sin. Uh, sin is the it's that number that goes up and down. Um, here it is. So it's that red curve. If you feed it one value, like a time value, for example, it will go up and down uh, continuously just like that. 
So that's exactly what we'll do. Let's do time. And we'll just feed it. What can we give it? Just normal time or sin time? We have sin time as well. Hmm. I'll give it this one. And as you can see, it goes up and down. And we see it in the preview, so it's happening live. I wonder what this one is. I don't know. Okay, let's use the first one. Now what we can do with that different value here is just um, add a vector to our existing value. So here we're going to say add, add this first vector to vertex position for sure. And then here we will add another number. Uh, if we're just to add a sin like this, I wonder what's going to happen. We're probably going to see some weird result, but let's just see it, right? We can press on, on save and see it. So this is what happens. We go in all the direction. Um, and the, the cool thing to notice here, and the important thing to notice, is that your sphere, as you see with the, the outline that Unity gives us, it doesn't really move. So if you have a collider on top of that, sphere collider, if you have a collider on top of that, it also doesn't move. So your game logic remains the same. And in fact, if I tab out, you don't see this updating because the window is not updating. In your game, it's going to keep on updating though, so just don't worry about that glitch. Um, but in logic-wise, it just stay there. So you see this a lot in video games where you have water, for example, like the wave go up and it goes down. And um, however, the exact position on the y-axis where you enter the water is always the same. Even though the wave goes up and down, you're always considered swimming, for example, when you're below one in y. Um, that's because the logic, I mean, the, the object is still there, right? So the water plane could be still there. Um, the only difference now is that the way your GPU renders it is a different place. So if you want to make sure that this doesn't look too weird, you could also split that. I'm doing a weird example here. We don't really have to do that, but uh, I'll just do it real quick. For example, we can put uh, a vector 3 with 0 0.5 in the Y, and we'll multiply the input of our sin with that, multi uh, with, the, with that vector we just created. And put that in here. It's kind of a mess, but I just want it to go up and down. And I think I got the wrong axis. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Let's do Z in this case. Right, so we got a ball right now that hovers. Uh, very simple stuff. So you understand that everything regarding this section here at the top is with the geometry. Now, everything that goes beneath that is for the color. Let's do something else here. Let's do, um, we could do something that makes a little bit more sense. For example, a gradient here would be a better choice. Uh, we choose our gradient, I believe. Can we output that directly? It seems like we can't because there's a small G right here, which means you output something that is a gradient. And as you can see here, the fragment node doesn't want to take any of that. So we're just going to put it in the, uh, in the open. Let's see what it takes. It takes in a input gradient sample gradient. Okay, we have to, we have to sample this gradient. Uh, which makes sense, right? You have to choose where you're going to be choosing from the value. And here you have another input value called time. So I believe, I'm just going to hook this up first, hit save. I believe we can just go here, input a time value, and let's just drag and drop that here, see what happens. So we go from blue to blue and to blue. So maybe you want to use something like the send time. And here you can see it goes up and down. So it goes in between 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.5, I think so, or it's minus 1 to 1. Basically, it plays around with the gradient just fine. Um, and now we save, and we have this kind of thing going on. So when it's down there, it goes to blue, no, yellow, and when it's up there, it goes to blue. So we've made a very simple shader, and um, the, the real key here point to understand today is that these two are split apart now. They didn't used to be split apart, but now they are. And it's so much easier to understand. I hope that you guys understand this. It's a, a concept that was there before and they destroyed this concept. Well, no, it was still there, but like they abstracted it so much when we had the first version of Shader Graph. Now we're at version, I don't know, I think it's like version 10. And we finally got this back. So I'm really, really glad that it happened. And I hope you guys are as well. On that note, I'm going to be making a tutorial tomorrow um, because... I have something else to do with Shader Graph. <laughs> and it's actually, I have something to do with the scriptable rendering pipeline tomorrow. So be on the lookout of that if you're interested. It's all for the multiplayer game I'm making. And uh, yeah, that's it. I'll see you guys very soon. Cheers.